All right, we're right at 12 noon central time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, welcome everyone. My name is Alec Harris. I'm honored to be president of GIA Publications. I'm so excited to be here with Dylan Savage and Joe Skillen about to talk about the amazing resource and book that we just published called The Transposed Musician, Teaching Universal Skills to Improve Performance and Benefit Life. Uh, we receive a lot of manuscripts at GIA, but there was this one when it came in, just rose right to the top of our priority list. We were so excited about it. Not only is it beautifully written, very compelling, but the information is so important and so relevant to music uh, uh, teachers today. And the topic couldn't be more timely in this era of distance learning. So let me just tell you a little bit about Dylan and Joe, and, uh, and then we'll get going with our discussion. Uh, by the way, we do have a coupon code uh, for 10% off the book on the GIA website. So if you use the code SKILLS, S-K-I-L-L-S, -L -L all lowercase, you will get 10% off on, their, on the amazing book that Dylan wrote. So Dylan Savage is a Bosendorfer concert artist, a first place winner in the Rome Festival Orchestra competition, and has recorded on Capstone Records. He is co-author of A Symposium for Pianists and Teachers, Strategies to Develop the Mind and Body for Optimal Performance. And he is an Associate Professor of Piano at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte and holds a BM from Oberlin University and uh, MM and Doctor's degrees from Indiana University's Jacobs School of Music. So welcome, Dylan, and he's the main author of our book, The Transposed Musician. Also, Joe Skillen, He's professor of music and departmental chair of the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, in a brand new position that he just started on July 1st of this year. Joe is a performer, teacher, scholar, and administrator who has sought creative opportunities throughout his 25 year teaching career. Examples of his scholarly and creative work include over 40 publications, three book chapters, 12 professional recordings, musical transcriptions, and multiple solo performances on four continents. His infectious passion for learning reveals itself when teaching students from all over the US and the world and comes full circle as he watches his students move into their own diverse fields of inquiry. Alumni from his studio are active performers, teachers, professors, department chairs, attorneys, physicians, engineers, and financial specialists. And he believes deeply in service as seen through his work with service learning courses, entrepreneurial curricular development, and leading multiple study abroad experiences. Prior to his appointment at UNC Charlotte, Skilling was named a distinguished professor at the Galante Endowed and the Galante Endowed Professor at Louisiana State University. And always a willing collaborator, he is thrilled with his vocation that combines his love of people, music, and lifelong learning. So welcome again to you both. And why don't we just start by asking you this question, Dylan. Why don't you give us a quick overview of your book and why you felt it was an important book to write? Wonderful. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction and thank you to GIA and to Alec Harris and of course to um, my new chair of the department, uh, Dr. Joseph Skillen. And I'm going to give you this uh, brief overview, but I just want to start by saying that this book is about tools. It's about having an amazing toolkit right next to you to use um, for anything that you wish. And so the uh, transposed musician is really, it's a practical guide for how to teach universal skills in the music lesson. But it does more than that. It not only shows you how to apply it, to music, but the second half of each chapter that deals with a specific skill teaches you also how and encourages you actually, I should say more, how to apply those skills to anything else in life as well. Now, as we know, universal skills are, as I say, tools. They allow you to do something much more efficiently, much more effectively. And I only have to look back to my years of practice as a young student where I spent tremendous amounts of time repeating these. I was a very diligent young student, but I didn't know much about focus. I didn't know much about problem solving. In fact, 
I didn't even, you, you couldn't have asked me if, if you did, excuse me, but I, I wouldn't have been able to answer that. Well, what is, what is creativity? I'm just trying to play the notes or try to make some music. So this book deals with eight of those um, skills and I'm going to read them because I absolutely never get them straight. So if you don't mind, um, they are uh, problem solving, focus, patience, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, improvisation, analytical thinking, and creativity. Now, each of these topics are spoken about in the book exhaustively, and you, you have a very systematic approach. They're defined, they're shown how to be applied to music, and then, as I said, how to apply them um, to life. Now, the reason I wrote this is I was getting so many students that were coming to me who weren't able to practice efficiently. They were spending tremendous amounts of time and they were once again very diligent. But when they would come and play, they would be mystified as to why they couldn't remember, they couldn't memorize, passages didn't work out. And when I started asking them, I would ask them, well, what, what a key is this? Or how do you practice your focus? Or have you ever even thought about thinking about the whole piece in one unit sitting quietly alone? And had you actually thought analytically about why you made this choice and that choice? So I started to find out that none of those things were really being uh, really taught that I knew of. And so I decided that was the major reason. I thought those are so important. And, and the third reason is that we as music teachers have always said, you know, we teach much more than, than the instrument or music. Um, we teach life skills as well. And indeed those things are, um, are used so much in the lesson, but for the most part, they're not being taught systematically. It's up to the student to actually, as it was to me, to figure out how to get this darn Bach fugue <laughs> memorized so I didn't fall apart in a performance but I wasn't given any systematic steps. So in a nutshell, that's what this book does. It empowers you to take command of something and not be mystified as to why your hard work is not um, you know, coming to fruition. Right. And so, so it says that, that, that's, that's my great passion. As I said, my, I think every teacher's goal is to make, um, teach themselves out of a job. I want my students to be absolutely, totally independent. In fact, I want them to do it better than I did. And I often say to them, you know, you're getting stuff that I never got at that age. So, you know, you're, you're gonna be ahead of this uh, by a long shot. So um, I think that helps really explain the premise. And then we'll go into some, we'll do a few of these um, topics more in depth to see how they actually unfold. One of the things that I uh, hear about a fair amount, and it always kind of frustrates me is, well, you know, music makes you better at math, or music makes you better at reading, or things that aren't, and, and uh, you know, it's a both hand. Music is part of the whole experience of what it is to be a person, and it all works together. And uh, so one of the things that uh, I like about your book is it's not about, you know, being a musician is going to help you better with your math. It's about how does it all work together? How do we learn from other, what are the cross learnings that can happen to improve our musicianship for sure, because that's why folks are in music class, but also these problem solving skills will help folks in other areas of their life as well. And that's a really important message. And uh, uh, one of the things I also wanted to mention too, is that we do have a Q and a panel and we are planning to, Ask, feel free to ask your questions. We'll ask them along the way. We're going to reserve the last bit of this webinar as well for all of your questions. So feel free to participate in any way that you can. And let's go to the very first skill that, uh, that you talk about, which is problem solving. So why is it so critical for musicians to be very adept at applying this skill both in and out of the field of music? And if problem solving is being done correctly, it requires the person to think deeply about every aspect of the issues at hand. It's only through this kind of introspection that the skill and the universal skills improve. So what are your thoughts about problem solving and how do you talk about it? Yes, well, I, I certainly introduce it almost at the first lesson of every student that I um, work with as an incoming freshman. And I, I feel this is sort of the, the very top of the list of, of all universal skills. And we'll talk later how they all interlink as, Alec has already said, but problem solving is um, how you can be efficient at what the issue is. And I'm gonna demonstrate very 
uh, in a few minutes or actually a minute or two on the piano what I mean by that. So problem solving is a series of, of steps. And if you systematize something, you have something tangible which to work with. Now, I've often been surprised, and, and it's, part, it's part of the development of a student. But the first thing, you have to know that the problem exists. And many students are sort of maybe vaguely aware that one exists, but uh, are not sure. But so if you can't even um, actually get to first base on that area, you won't be able to get the next step, which is very important, which is to specifically pinpoint what the issue is. So you might say, I think the rhythm is wrong. And that's not unlike saying, well, the car doesn't work. Well, what do you mean by that? Um, well, it won't start. Okay. Well, that's not the problem yet. We, it might be a starter. It might be a battery. It might be something else. So I have each of the students think a great deal about this. And these kinds of things have to, the teacher has to constantly prompt this throughout um, the lesson. And for weeks and months, this is a skill that takes years to develop very well. So let me go over the steps very well. Know that there is a problem. Second, define it. What, by the, I, by the, uh, what I mean by defining is literally down to the note. A lot of people spend a lot of time coming to the problem and wasting a tremendous amount of time. So once you know what it is, next step is define a very specific form plan of action. Then you actually take and um, you execute your plan of action. And of course, you're always listening very deeply and you're taking information in. So that guides you to the next step, which is do I like what I heard or will I change? it? So it's the cycle of between three and four, sort of um, doing the thing and, and then listening and analyzing. Some things you will throw out, other things you'll keep. And so that is largely, and of course, there's a section in here, it's called trial and error. We don't always know what to do, but trial and error has to be um, thought of as a step. Now, all of us do this. If we open the door, we try to open the door, we turn the knob one way and it doesn't work. Well, guess what? We turn it that way. So we actually do do this. But if we think about it systematically, we can really bring it to a much deeper level. So trial and error is not just about doing anything. It's really about exploring or, you know, and that's part of the creative process. And then finally, you just put it together. Now, let me just show you, I'm going to turn. You don't see the piano, but it's right next to me. And I'm going to show you what a student has, uh, you know, often they come to me and this is the issue. So I'm gonna show you a little trill. This is a part of a Brahms handle variation. The trill is not working out. Now, what you heard is me actually repeat the same thing over and over again. And that is one of the, the, the most um, prevalent problems with repeating. So here's what I'm gonna say about the problem solving. What is not working? that trill. How many trill notes do I play, for example, with my left hand? Well, so I know that now I've, by thinking about the trill very specifically, I've narrowed it down to I need to have one uh, two note trill, a second one, by the third note in my left hand, I actually have to play a triplet for it to work out. So there's a two against three in my left hand. Now you see what that does. The problem's not perfectly worked out, but now I know exactly how to work this out. So you hear the two duplets, then you hear the triplet against my uh, 16th note, and then it comes and it resolves. So now the, the next point is to take that and speed it up. Now, if I hadn't gotten to that point, so now how do you know there's a problem? Well, of course, it's not sounding right or you have to be guided from the beginning with a, a teacher. And as you get better and better, you'll be able to do more and more of this on your own. So the essence of problem solving, as I said, is really drilling much deeper into it and really focusing on the issue. And then it sounds, it'll sound like this. And then it'll all come together. Joe, how do you think about, yeah. Hi, thank you, Dylan, that's sure. great. Joe, uh, don't wanna leave you out. Uh, I know you have a lot to say. How do you, uh, first of all, again, welcome. How do you think about problem solving in what you do? Uh, thanks, Alec. Uh, and, and just to add to what uh, Dylan was suggesting, um, in my mind, I, I, I think of the problem solving paradigm as almost really just, um, 
giving students the uh, agency to make choices. So um, it, whether or not something's a problem is a matter of perspective. <laughs> uh, and, and so it, it's um, sometimes we don't know that there's an issue, sometimes we do, uh, but also just then I think of it in terms of uh, just making choices. So um, perhaps in a music lesson, we might play an example. Uh, and then play an example a very different way. And then just um, ask the student which they prefer. Ask them to discern what the difference between the two examples are. And then through that preference, could they replicate both of those? And so it's um, recognizing difference, which is the beginning of uh, beginning to solve problems. It's when you see that there could be a separate outcome or there's a a another way of possibly doing something that allows us to then um, make some choices. And so then those choices begin to help us discern whether or not something is a problem or something is, you know, just something that we would prefer to refine or whether or not something is just fine uh, as it is. So I, I think of it as um, opportunities for refined decision making. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally concur. Um, and what you were bringing up is this idea of creativity within the process. You start making choices in the problem. So um, that adds a lot to that process. So once this is defined, uh, as I said, I always like to have something that's rather systematic, a series of steps. Of course, it can always, everybody's going to ultimately make it their own unique process, but to start with. And um, then I, I do bring up after the student has um, gotten some uh, of this problem solving under their belt and are using it, I, I, I might ask them, I say, well, had you ever thought about how it might benefit you in life? And a lot of times I say, no, I hadn't. Um, and I'll say, well, why don't you um, think about this and come back um, next lesson and we'll just spend a few minutes. And I want to take this moment to also say that when you're talking about universal skills within the lesson, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of time out of each lesson. You could do it in less than five minutes but then it's over the course of time. And remember, you're also thinking about the skill in terms of the need of the student. So if the student has a fantastic ability to memorize, or maybe focus is not your, uh, you know, the point that you would, you would start with, it might be something else. Um, so I, they would come back and they say, you know, I, I thought about this, I have a part-time job, and you know, I always go in and I have this one problem that always bugs me. And you know, by thinking about it, in this way, I was able to break down what the issue was and not just sort of try to bull my way through it and, you know, just grit my teeth and get through it. I'm starting to look at all these little things. That sometimes they're very small, sometimes they're larger. Now, in doing this, the student is exercising this ability to problem solve um, in another area. And what that does is increase. It's very much like cross training. It increases your ability to apply it more and more. And of course, it will ultimately then benefit your music even more because you've exercised it outside uh, the realm of music. But um, the bottom line is the, yeah, the benefits. If I could just add to that, what I, what I like about what Dylan is saying is it also allows our students and even ourselves to be reminded of the um, long-term change that happens in problem solving. So many times we are aware of something and then our subconscious has to remember that and work on it slowly over time. Yeah. And we like see that. that progress happening slowly. So it might be that situation at your job where you start thinking, I identified this, and you start thinking about it. And over time, our thoughts and our actions tend to start adjusting to that identification and then tend to start thinking of modified behaviors that might help that particular situation. But it's a long-term thing. And it's something that ob often begins subconsciously. Yes. I often, I constantly, and this is the joy of teaching, have to remind um, students about this idea of things happening incrementally and to be patient, to allow these things to unfold over time. And there's a real beauty and delight in that process. You don't want things instantly. You know, you don't want to, you know, take in an entire beautiful scene in one half a second and then leave it. You might want to sort of just let it sort of envelop you for an hour and a half. And that's exactly what you were talking about. And it's, it's also getting the student, once again, I think this is the goal of all teachers, to be thinking about how, I mean, they become lifelong learners, lifelong problem solvers, and, and they enjoy the process. I mean, you know, because of what it enables them to do, ultimately, and how it helps, yeah. So 
I think from the standpoint of this, um, I think we've covered um, the two facets and, and we'll do that again in the next two topics. But um, once the student is getting comfortable with this, there's, it's a great idea to have them tell the teacher occasionally how they're using it and how they're uh, developing it. Of course, the, the teacher knows first time when they, <laughs> the, the first two minutes of the lesson, they know if they've problem solved because they hadn't figured out what they you know, were supposed to do last week. So um, this is the aspect you always know where uh, to attack. And, and the great thing about making errors, and I think a lot of people maybe are afraid of doing them, um, when a mistake tells you exactly what to do or what not to do. So it provides a wealth of information when you think about it. So make mistakes, make them joyfully and happily. Just don't make the same ones over and over again. So. I, I love the idea, first of all, of naming these skills and naming problem solving is something that we need to do. And then also, and then of course, taking what they learn outside of your uh, lessons or your classes and bringing it in and sharing those experiences. It, it just heightens that level of awareness. This is something we need to tend to, we need to work on problem solving, yes. we need to be creative on how we solve each problem. It's unique, but there are things that we can learn about the process and the approach that just seem uh, really, uh, really amazing, really helpful. And I think just again, uh, show that it's, a, that yes, it's about music and it's about musicianship, but also it has such broader application on everything that we do. So really, really, Absolutely. really critical. And that other piece also just that it's never done. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> you know, I was so just about to say. We it's, solve it's, something. There's always a refinement. There's always more things that can unfold. And so that's a beautiful part as well. I constantly tell my students, I said, you really think I've got this all locked up? <laughs> I'm still working. I'm still working on it. And, and that's what makes life so exciting. I have something to, to, to work toward. And, um, and I also tell the students that it gives them a great deal of sort of self empowerment. You're not at the whim of the winds. You are able to really focus and make change happen um, through these, you know, being able to solve and look in deeply into the problems. Of course, when you're problem solving, you're also analytical thinking. You're thinking that way and you're thinking patiently, right? And you're focusing and you're being creative. So all these things tie together. So, Absolutely. Well, let's move on to the next universal skill, which uh, you touched on, which is focus. And, you, you know, in this era yes. of short attention spans, and uh, I can think of no more important area for musicians to think about and to help with. And tell me a little bit about your thoughts about focus and how you work on focus in your music teaching. Joe, are you? I, 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 Dylan might be frozen, but I'll just, I'll just jump in uh, for a moment oh. and start by saying that um, for me, um, Musicians are often so um, aware of sound that we don't think about the most important piece, which is silence. And uh, Dylan and I were speaking about this yesterday, but the way that I approach um, focus is actually first being aware and helping a student become aware of um, the power of silence. So we actually begin, uh, um, and I try to encourage them to con consider having a meditation practice of some sort where we experience the silence of the room together, perhaps for 30 seconds mm. or a minute. And if students aren't used to this, it feels like an excruciatingly long period of time to have silence for, oh my goodness, a minute or even 30 seconds. But it's a real teacher to, when we can become aware of the passage of time that helps with our rhythm. But it also becomes a, a point where we can return to that sense of inner calm, that place that we need to call upon to help us perform uh, to our best. And so just the, the awareness of a, a peaceful, calm, quiet moment before we ever make sound, whether it's speaking or playing our instrument, is where I begin with uh, the, the piece of focus. Yes. Am I back? Yes. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, time travel, you know. So as I said, I, was, um, I had to apply it first to myself because I played long programs as a young person. And one of the things that always bedeviled me were these long Bach fugues. And I feared those because if I got lost or I had the moment little you know, uh, fracture of my attention, I could, I could really get lost. And uh, so I started thinking a lot about this, obviously by my 20s and 30s. And I realized that focus really was a mental muscle, the ability to keep 
other thoughts from intruding. They were always intruding. And in fact, they always, don't they intrude the most when you le least want them? <laughs> You know, so right before a performance, your mind is like this, uh, a room of unruly children, you know. And so um, I turned, the whole, the whole premise of my chapter on focus is really just exactly what Joe mentioned. It's about, it's based in meditation, which is that you're thinking, uh, well, first of all, you're in silence. And you're ridding the mind of all thoughts. Now, that's very hard to do. Seconds or 20 seconds of that, a thought will right, Dylan. Uh, you, you cut on in a second. Can you just say that again real quick, that last sentence? Yes. Um, about the, what was it from the steps of meditation and breathing deeply? Or was it before that? That's okay. good. So, yes. So as I said, the start of the process is that you have to understand that the mind has to be focused on one thing, or in some instances, nothing at all. But it, it is, it's an ability that the mind has to remain in a very focused state. As I said, it could be focused on nothing or focused on breath or focused on the peace at hand. And by the way, remaining very much in the moment, you know, which oftentimes we, we, we ruminate on the mistake we made, we start to fear that difficult passage that's about to come in another page from now, we're not being in the present. So what focus is about is controlling your mind enough so that you can actually say, stay still little child. And so you start out with little baby steps. Try to go for 30 seconds without a thought in Try to go 50 seconds to a minute. And then after a while, we transfer that problem all the way through without losing the thread. So we've got a 15 measure piece. It's a, it's a big difference to hear an entire Beethoven sonata. That's called audiation. And, um, at some point you're hearing harmonies as well. So it tr takes tremendous. Now let me just show you what I'm talking about. I was a, a performer when I was young that was all sort of basic muscle memory. Boy, if that got off though, I could get in trouble. So this idea of focusing, what am I focusing on? I actually have to have an entity. Well, that entity it has to be an oral sense of what the piece is. If I don't know what the melody is, how can I focus on it? If I don't know what the chords are, how can I focus? So let me, I'm going to turn to the piano and demonstrate this to you. Now remember this because when I was a young student, I walked on stage to play a piece that I could play in my sleep. The opening chord totally eluded me. And so this idea of focus, figuring out what it was I was playing all. So the opening chord is C sharp minor. Then you stop. The next chord is C sharp minor, but a seventh chord resolving to a four chord. You should be able to do this all the way through your piece. And let me tell you, it trains focus to a one, to an odd. Now there's a space. This is where things get problematic because there's no muscle. Memory. What's the starting note of the next melody line? It's the fifth scale degree, the G sharp. It goes to an E, trill, results to a G sharp. It goes to a C sharp. Now, I learned to do that all the way through a piece, unbroken. I could do that in my mind without playing the piece, and then I could also do it physically, and I would stop along the way. So now that takes a lot of time to do. But if we're performers, and this is what I'm talking about giving tools, why do my students constantly say, well, I could play it in the practice room, but when they play it in front of me, they can't do it. That's because there's a little extra pressure and their mind has been fractured. So it is so important to learn how to do this. So the, anyway, the chapter shows step-by-step step how to develop that mind like a muscle. And that's what it is. It's a process. It will take years. And I remember when I was 15, reading about Arthur Rubinstein learning an entire piece of music on the train because the conductor wanted a different concerto. And I thought that was absolutely impossible to do, but he was able to do the entire process right there. So in a nutshell, that's what I'm talking about um, and how critical focus is. And finally, no one has ever talked about it as a series of steps. It was like, well, Dylan, you just, you just need to figure out how to focus or you just need to, um, you know, focus longer and not have it break, you know? Well, all <laughs> good advice to a point. So anyway, this systematizes it.
So Joe, I know you have some things to say. I'm sorry, I don't mean to. Oh, no, the, I, I appreciate it. I was just thinking that actually a, a, a way that I have thought about this is um, tonal scaffolding. Uh -huh. So it's, the, it's exactly what you're talking about, where um, the focus that allows us to focus on the um, scaffold then allows the more fascinating pieces, the expressive pieces to hang upon that scaffolding and, and the ability yes. to take yourself phrase by phrase and knowing the architecture of that piece um, it is, uh, it's a mental journey, but it's also then that expressive journey that we have. And uh, we can, if we can do it both physically and mentally uh, through in a place of meditation where we might be able to totally envision that perfect performance going across that scaffolding, the um, studies are showing that there's no difference to the brain um, as to whether or not that's a mental process or whether or not it's a physical process. And, and so the power of that mental practice and going through that scaffolding um, has um, multiple um, rewards. But the biggest one is that um, we don't fatigue our physical side while we can still practice and actually uh, strengthen the performance through really making that scaffolding that's m much more secure. That's great. That's a wonderful point, yeah. So we have a question in the, in the chat. Uh, about strategies and tactics for working with younger kids, uh, you know, even elementary age kids, uh, where just focus is such a notorious problem for them. If you have any thoughts about uh, working with the youngest of us, and there's a follow up to that as well. I, I can start uh, if, if you don't mind uh, with that, but I'm just thinking about with younger kids. Um, they're naturally competitive, number one, so that, that you can use that to your advantage. Uh, they're naturally um, energetic. You can also use that to their advantage, to your advantage. <laughs> but but uh, I, I like the idea of approaching it as a game. And so you could think about playing uh, an example of maybe a five note example. And um, you could um, ask them to close their eyes and um, you could just set a metronome, for example, and you, you can say, um, I want you to remember the exercise that I played for you just a moment ago, and I want you to sing the last note when we would arrive, but no one's going to be singing it. You need to sing it in your mind. And, and so you play it once for them, and then you set your metronome or just snap your fingers, and then have them sing the first note and the last note and see if they can get it together. And so the competitive aspect is not who wins, it's who lands exactly right on the place. And so then you can just, uh, you know, okay, everyone, let's all try to get in the right place. And so that helps them develop that internal sense of timing and scaffolding that happens mentally rather than it always to, having to be physically present. Yes, we, we must have been on the exact same wavelength. That's exactly um, as uh, close to what I've mentioned uh, also in my book. One of the games is counting backward from 100. Um, but then it's, it's singing little um, tunes that we all know um, but without singing them. So we would start with, oh. And they would say, light. Light. <laughs> and, can, and, 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 but this then can get to pieces of music that they're playing. And, um, and then you start with little pieces. So yes, I love the idea of turning it into a game to be competitive but anything that requires an unbroken bit of, of focus. I mean, sometimes taking, you know, pick up sticks so you don't move another one, you know? <laughs> you know, you have to be very focused. Which one am I gonna move that I don't break the pile down or whatever? So, uh, but then always connect it somehow to the music making process and start step by step. But it's, it, it's quite a, you know, we live in an age when everything is immediate. I call it the age of immediacy. So we have an uphill battle and uh, so we, we just have to constantly encourage it and engage the student within the lesson, create the games that you mentioned, and then have them, they begin to see the, the effects of good focus. You know, you have two NFL teams. They're all equal in ability, but one wins and one loses, and it's almost always the mental game. Right. And so that's a, sort of the ultimate goal. And um, you can say to the kids, you know, not only this is going to help you in your music, but you know that soccer that you love to play as a kid, you know, you're going to be able to use this same kind of focus to outsmart your opponent or to, to you know, pick up more signals from, you know, what you're seeing on, on the field, that kind of thing. So once again, relating it to something else where it'll be a benefit is part of the motivation. So one, one of uh, Stephanie's follow-up questions has to do with uh, 
getting the kids to go from more than one, from one thing of focus at a time to maybe multiple things? Are there any techniques you can have them do? And, and part of that is uh, having them be comfortable with making mistakes. So how do you get them to be aware of more than one thing at a time with some of the focus? A, a suggestion that I, I might offer is um, what I would call focused awareness. And so if you have the group playing or you might have just, just um, uh, one person playing, you might stop them and just say, what do you hear? What are you aware of? And uh, so then they could speak about, uh, I think I hear the air conditioner, <laughs> or I think I hear, you know, there's a clarinet playing next to me, or uh, maybe you could get them to focus even further. What note are they playing? Are they playing the same note as you? And, and so then just kind of have just little, um, little brief moments of exploration where they can explore um, focused awareness. Are you focused not only on what you're doing, but what's around you? And then as you share, you might discover that you're making a mistake like, oops, I didn't say what the teacher wanted to hear, but you're still aware of something that's important. And, and so um, that conversation of, I'm aware of this, um, I, I notice it, um, and then we can just begin to hone our focus on the things that are um, more pertinent to that particular topic. Yeah. Well, I certainly like the idea of um, having them, you know, start to not become so afraid. And so I often have my students play nonsense pieces. Like, let's say your nonsense walls. <laughs> You know, so you can get the waltz going and you can play just any old notes and everything is, you know, wrong or if you like to look at it in a Cajun look, it's, it's whatever, it's fine. But it breaks that barrier. And uh, as I said, I really like uh, certainly this, um, the idea of creating uh, the sense of ease and the, um, the game aspect of it. But um, always let us do no, this is pro perhaps the mental control is perhaps the hardest of all skills to really, you know, they sit on that mountaintop for years. <laughs> um, so it's, 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 I find it the most difficult of all. I can sit and mindlessly practice all day long, but if I'm not hooking up my mind, I just get off the bench because it's just wasted time. So if your mind is fatigued, let me go into this. It's really difficult to focus hard when your mind is fatigued. Um, or if you're in a, a situation where there's a lot of, you know, input or noise around you. So when you're wanting to, to sort of practice your focus, find a quiet place, hopefully early in the morning. And it often can set your entire body for the day by sitting quietly. Um, and it's not a bad idea to do that intermittently all throughout the day. Great. Great. And, uh, and, and Stephanie adds that a lot of what you're talking about also sounds similar to something called Calmer Choice, which is a social emotional learning plan oh. that allows uh, helps students try to focus on the present and to be mindful of the present moment yes. and I think through all of that as well. So excellent. I think, I think these are great. Yeah. Uh, all right. So maybe we should move on to the, the next topic, which is the one I think that intimidates a lot of people the most. Yes is creativity. So uh, I'm so glad that that was a part of your book because uh, I, I think the more, uh, I think a lot of folks actually shut down when they hear about creativity, how to teach creativity. Maybe they have some, some of their own self doubts about their own creative skills, or I'm not really sure what it is, but this is a big challenge for a lot of folks. So talk, talk about that universal skill of creativity and how you try to inspire that with your students. I'm going to have um, Joe take care of this. I need to plug my computer in. Um, I, the battery, I, I thought I did that. So if you'll take care of that. All right. So the creativity in action right here. Okay. The, um, <laughs> so um, the teaching of creativity is a, it's a fascinating thing. And um, I, I like to think of uh, creativity as exploring possibility. So uh, every situation um, has an, possibly a determined outcome or possibly an outcome that has not yet been explored or discovered. And so I, I think um, when we uh, empower our students to think that they have agency in the way something could finish from where it starts is um, that bit of agency that they feel allows them to begin to explore that um, a particular um, passage of music or a particular phrase or a particular just physical breath that they're taking or an approach to the instrument could have any number of outcomes. 
And to be comfortable with those different outcomes is the beginning of understanding um, the power we have as artists. Um, so um, comfort with uh, an, an an ambiguous end that we can control uh, is something that begins to open up the space for creativity. And it allows basically an envelope for experimentation, an envelope for creative mistake making, but I'll call mistake making just an opportunity to pull yourself into somewhere else. So it, it's a bit like, a, 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 I was a, saying to Dylan yesterday, it's a, like a Bob Ross painting. That there's not a mistake, there's just like a happy opportunity to make another tree, you know? And, and, and so that, that's what um, we can begin to show our students through our own example um, by, you know, um, perhaps, I challenge my students in their lessons um, to play a phrase for me 10 different ways. And anything is possible. So they may experiment with like the very basic things at the beginning, articulation difference, dynamic difference. But I say, wait a minute, you could actually change notes. That's okay. You're just going to go from point A to point B. And so then they begin to understand that their parameters are much broader than they might have previously thought. And then when you begin to open up their parameters, they begin to explore things on their own. And so that's really the first bit of it is to take them out of the, um, the right, wrong, um, paradigm and more into the um, you have agency to create something um, within a framework so there's a variation uh, within this framework that you can work with and why don't you explore that uh, set of variations uh, Dylan did you have something you wanted to add to that yes well that's um, I, I give a whole you know list of things that are part of the creative process and I certainly let me say at the outset, um, part of it is mis uh, you know, mysterious. We don't know exactly you know, totally how it works, but I can tell you some of the things you do need. Uh, one of the things is you need a little um, background in what it is you're about to do. All right, so it's hard to be creative. I mean, I would, it'd be hard for me to be creative to design a new surgical technique in you know, heart surgery. Um, but let's, I'm gonna use uh, one of the, the major uh, parts that I always use to get people started and you just alluded to that, and that is uh, the art of variation. Nothing is really truly new when you think about it um, under the sun, and um, everything is some variant of that. And I'm going to, so I love this idea of reverse engineering. So I'm going to talk to you about how you can be creative just through varying, making little variations on something. Now let's see what Brahms did. I um, played a little bit of his, one of his variations he built one of the greatest pieces of music for pianists, it's some 25 minute long piece, out of three simple notes, and then just one, five chord, one. Now, if you were to, if you were to be asked, I want 25 minutes of music uh, approximately, you know, 20 variations, all different, based on those three ascending notes and those, those chords. All right, so let's see how he does this. And you'll see how through reverse engineering, and I really advocate that. If you want to see how something is done, look at it deeply, closely. You want to see how a Lexus is so quiet? Take apart their muffler. Um, so, so the opening one is... Okay, so that you hear, that's the opening. He's doing a theme from Handel. Now let's listen to that again. It becomes... On the third variation, he does the same thing, the three ascending notes, but he does them this way. And then they sound like this. So this became... And then you can do it in octaves and you can do it in minor. Okay, so the art of variation is really just mixing stuff up. Now, this, uh, this is one of the great ways to be um, something that people can actually do tangibly. It's a tangible thing. And then um, if they're doing something outside the field of music, it's just the same sort of same thing. Let's just say you were wanting to design a new, you know, 
a, a handbag. Well, you would still have the pouch and the same straps and then the enclosure, but you could do all sorts of things to vary those processes, okay? So that in a nutshell is really what, um, when you reverse engineer, that's what they're doing. And these are the greatest geniuses in the world and it's all a variation. And then you start seeing everything in life this way. Every door handle is slightly different, but it has that same function. Every running shoe is changed. Those designers are the best in the world. Nike doesn't hire people off, you know, off the street. But when you look at the shoe, they're just endless variations. Have you seen how the eyelet on the shoe is not no longer round, but oblong? And the, well, you have little threads running through your shoelaces that create splashes of color. And even the shoelaces themselves are no longer straight. They're round, they're, you know, have zigzags. And so anyway, it's alive and well everywhere around you. So um, that is one of the, the great ways to start um, becoming creative. And then this art of variation, let me show it to you, bleeds into your interpretation. And this is sort of the beginning of, so I'm gonna start this trill of that nocturne that I play. I'm gonna play it two or three different ways. different ways. Then maybe I could do it even more searchingly. Now through the act of variation, I have made three really very different, but in a small, these aren't really vastly different. Remember, these are small changes, but they're big changes. So that's how you employ this. And when you start thinking about it, of course, it has to have a relationship to the basic design. If you're a Corvette engineer, you notice, have you ever noticed how the Mustang has always looked like the Mustang? Why do you think that is? It doesn't look like the Volkswagen Beetle. Those engineers have to know the context of the design. You have to know the context of your piece and stay within that zone. The Corvette is the same way from 19... 55 to now, it still has that same basic shape, same with the Porsche, but anyway. Um, so they're very aware of these things and that's how they work. And that's how really a great deal of creativity is. It, it's that part such of a, the solution. Yeah, so. Such a powerful message. And I love that idea right. of working within the constraints of your area of comfort in music yes. as well. Everyone has an area of comfort of what they do. And right. it could be just even singing a lullaby or the most basic thing. I mean, even within those, those areas, there's so many things you can do that can be creative, that can inspire that sense of creativity. And also where you should, with your students, you should reward that. You should, you know, I think it's great, always important to think about that and encourage it in whatever context you have. And it's uh, just, again, uh, uh, such a, a wonderful thing. And I know we've got about uh, 15 minutes left. Uh, so I want to encourage folks again to, uh, Please, if you have them, to ask any questions you have of Dylan and Joe. And also, uh, you do want to, I, you wanted to, I think, Joe, you wanted to say something as, as well. I just wanted to add, Alec, to what you said, uh, which I completely agree with, um, just as some teaching techniques. Um, I find that since creativity is sometimes so um, scary for students because they're, they want to please their teachers, they want to be right. And, and so sometimes you have to give them a framework to use. So you might say, okay, now let's, let's do something with rhythm. Explore rhythm. Let's do something with, you know, uh, dynamics. Uh, I, 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 tuba is my instrument. So I'll say, let's do something by changing your tone color. Uh, but, but letting them explore with parameters so that they, they can begin to feel what's possible. And the other thing that as a teacher, I, I have learned to appreciate is um, to use the word fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when, when a student does something and you did not expect it, or perhaps you didn't even like it, it's always fascinating. <laughs> and, and, and so then you're not giving judgment. You're just saying that is fascinating and you're being honest it's because genuine. it's something you did not expect. And it's something that you perhaps are definitely going to learn from. So I, I just, I've found sometimes our words that we use with our students um, to respond to them and to give them a framework is also very, very helpful. That's right. And that's really critical. You never want to shut down any attempt at a student for a student to be creative. You want to foster and encourage it. You never want to shut it down. And it's so easy with a side comment to just totally shut that down. Oh. So really, really important. Uh, Dylan, you talked a little bit about transference 
as it regards to creativity. Is that what you're talking about? Just transferring the, uh, uh, well, maybe you should explain. Yeah, the basic, the basic premise is this um, idea of, of variation. And I mean, there are other, as I said, parameters. Remember those engineers who are designing those Corvettes do have backgrounds in, in design. But, um, but back to the um, idea of variation. So let's just say I, I have a part-time job where I have a, a rather um, difficult worker to, you know, I have to work with this person, I have to collaborate with them, but they're always making life difficult. Well, I'm gonna problem solve. I'm also gonna be patient. And I'm gonna try varying my behavior to see if it might make some kinds of improvements. So and if he has a snide comment to make toward me, I might just ignore it or I might just shrug instead of sort of coming back to him with a, you know, a light comment. Okay, so that's a variation in my behavior. So I'm actively using this idea of change. Now, I'm also gonna be working off his responses as well. And I'm always gonna be balancing what I hear. So he might respond favorably to that. I mean, he didn't get any pushback from me at that time. And so, ah, I might be onto something. And so this is that, um, you, you'll start seeing this as if you use this, it's a very conscious approach. And all I might have had to do is just say uh, nothing, as opposed to say, or, you know, and, and that's how it starts. So let's say, what if I have another example? Um, I, I'm trying to, you know, do, so, I, I'm actually writing. And the act of writing is really all those versions that before it goes to press, every one is, is a variant. And what, what the variations also do is tell you it's part of that problem solving what you don't want to do. So you, you basically go into a situation and it starts feeding you information and you have choices to make. You can, you can choose to operate this way or to react that way. And then if you react in a certain way, you get a response and then you can vary that to help modify that response. So anyway, it, that, that is in a personal interrelationship kind of um, example. Um, as I said, the, the idea of variation is, can be applied in, in the book. I have a person dressing mannequin. There are window dressers, people who dress windows. And this sure. one person got this job and then had to do, well, all they had to do is add maybe a, 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 a different color belt to the mannequin and add, change the shirt, maybe put on a hat. And all of a sudden, the mannequin has dramatically changed, but you know, the shirt's still the same, the trousers were still the same, but. So Dylan, can you talk a little bit about how you see the universal skills linking and interlinking to each other? For example, isn't problem solving helped by creativity and wouldn't patience help with focus? And uh, how, how do these all work together? Well, um, in a way they all work best if they're interlinked. So say you're, you're, you're really having you know, to, to figure out some issue with your, um, your piece of music, but if you don't have the patience to stick with it or the focus, the problem solving process itself is not going to be as effective. And so after you, um, I, I wouldn't introduce this all as you know, this big amalgam, but it becomes like an amalgam. And by that I mean, um, when I'm doing one thing, it's assisted by many of these other skills. For example, the problem solving is actually a creative process. It also requires a great deal of focus. I remember everything I do reveals to me uh, something that I may want then to change or react to. Um, it also requires communication. I have to actually communicate to myself, right? If I'm not able to articulate in my mind what it is. Um, and it requires, as I said, so almost every aspect of all the skills interlink, some more than others. But um, be thinking about that as your, um, it's like a link in a chain. Yeah, great. Joe, do you see them connecting as well? I do. Uh, in fact, um, I, I see them sort of in a large sort of life context that um, I like to think that uh, my students uh, and uh, me to the ex extent that I, I try every day is to approach life as an artist. Mm -hmm. And so that usually means that a, a situation can be approached artistically. You don't need to be playing your instrument. So there are opportunities for focus. There's opportunities for creativity. There's opportunities for variation in daily things. And if you kind of approach life um, with these skills, you kind of see the world as an artist. I, I'm uh, 
very proud of my students that are doing things other than uh, their careers in music. Um, but it makes me happy to know that I have uh, people that are uh, financial out and analysts that are actually looking at numbers in an artistic way. They're thinking about patterns. They're thinking about creatively organizing things. Doctors who are thinking about creatively working with people, creatively solving medical problems that really have come from their work um, I'd like to think with me, but more their, their work in music where they've discovered their agency and they've discovered their possibilities of creating uh, new outcomes. So um, they're all interlinked and I think they also transcend into our lives so that we begin to walk through life as artists that have creative possibilities, whether or not we're making sound. Yeah, that's really, really powerful. And I, in the couple minutes that we have last, left in this COVID era, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is what can we be done in a distance learning environment? Is this something that is easier to teach within distance learning situations? Is it harder? Are there ideas you have about working with these universal skills and music in distance learning situations? Well, why don't I let Joe start with this and then, yeah, because I've often gone first. I mean, certainly there are challenges, uh, but I think there are opportunities in this period of time. Um, and something that um, I have tried to do with my students and they've done with me as well is that we provide each other um, listening examples uh, and we start making uh, video lists and, and we start sharing music that's important to us. And, and we might start with a theme where we might say, let's come up with a, a theme and variation, for example. So uh, we, we might just throw out a tune, all the things you are. And everybody start listing your favorite versions of all the things you are. And, and we just watch those. And then we get together and have a Zoom session and just discuss the variations that we saw. So th there's those chances for individual reflection and then coming back together. Uh, and I think those have provided some richer conversations than they would have if we were face to face. Because chances are we wouldn't have had those particular conversations because we would have been so focused on product and, and sort of doing things the way we quote normally do. Uh, this new setting has provided us chances for reflection and chances for asking deeper questions and providing space for students to reflect and then gather together. And so I think in some ways it has made me um, feel uh, like a different student because I've had to learn new things like they're learning new things and um, they see that learning curve. And I think for us to explore that together has been actually very um, empowering uh, for, for them and uh, for me and to just realize that there's so much more to this uh, learning process. Even when you think you've got it figured out, it's an opportunity to figure that there are new ways of doing things. Yeah. Well, I, I like all that you're, you, you've said. Um, I don't see the, this new medium or this virtual medium as any barrier to getting across um, the ideas of, of universal skills and how to apply them. So if anything, they're needed more now than ever because um, students are, are forced to um, you know, there are a lot more things they're thinking about. And let me just mention this one aspect, um, which is fear of the unknown. So fear is a very, um, you know, it's, we, we all know what it is, and it can be certainly very, um, very difficult to, to manage sometimes. Um, but could we use a universal skill, for example, to help at least modify or um, downplay, not, not downplay it, but to help it a little bit? What if we were to say, and, and we can speak openly, the students say, you know, I'm very afraid about this time frame. And I would say, well, um, very understandable, and I, I feel the same way you do. Could we use analytical thinking, perhaps, or some kind of one of these skills to perhaps um, reveal some of the reasons why you are afraid? If something is unknown, could we make it more known so that we could then be a little less afraid of it, for example? Um, or we could see a way out of this, or we can see a way forward. Or what am I going to do in the meantime? How, how am I going to make the best of this, for example? And so these, once again, become these very important tools. It's sort of like, um, you know, you have this big box of tools now that you're functioning with, but you have no idea how you're going to use them. But I can assure you those, those situations will come up and now you'll have at least something. It's not the complete answer, but it gives you a sense, once again, that you have a little more control um, over what you're doing. So I, th I think they're very important today uh, more than ever. Great. Well, thank you. I think we're, our hour is okay. already done. Uh, I want to thank you both for your time. Dylan Savage, author of Transposed Musician, 
And uh, there is a coupon code, lowercase skills, on the GI website to get 10% off the uh, amazing book where he goes into a lot more detail on all of these universal skills. And Joe Skillen, thank you both so much for your wisdom, for your time today. And, uh, and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Thanks. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you all so right. much. Okay. Take care. All the best.